Um, our second presenter is Mr. Bill Wan. He's presenting a topic titled, Everything You Wanted to Know About Aquarium Plumbing and Pumps But Were Afraid to Ask. Bill Wan is known for his self-built 20,000 full reef tank, which is the focal point of his living room. The tank is the largest privately owned tank of its kind in North America, and Juan designed it and all of its support systems, including pipes, filters, sump pools. He literally built the house around the tank, making sure to include a very elaborate and nearly self-sufficient filtration system. Here to present a talk about everything you wanted to know about aquarium plumbing and pumps, Mr. Bill Juan. Hi. Um, okay, I guess this works. So I was going to start with a nice song and all, but I think I'm going to avoid that because, you know, we're here to learn about some piping. So a lot of you guys have reef tanks. I figured that's why you guys are here. And, you know, I'm on the boards a lot and I watch and I see what everybody does with the piping and stuff. And over the years, I've answered questions, I've taken questions, I've tried to help as much as I could. but. What I found out is a lot of the piping is done haphazardly or just completely wrong in some instances. One guy will say, oh, this works so good, let's run with it, and then people are running down the, you know, the alley with this thing, and it's just not the proper way to do something. Um, I've been screwing with PVC pipes since I was a little kid, believe it or not. I used to carry around a suitcase when I was a kid full of PVC pipes and hoses and stuff like that. That's what I liked to do when I was a kid. I just messed with piping. And throughout the years, I've worked on various different kinds of chemical systems, biological systems, fermentation, bioreactors, and things like that, where we have to keep everything sterile. Um, ultra pure water systems, where we have to keep the water extremely clean. And this all just kind of funneled back into the reef tank. And I took it from there and started, you know, doing things the right way. So. I'm going to go through a little step-by-step -step here. We're going to start off with cutting pipes and the best way to cut things, the worst way to cut things, bonding, gluing, and things like that. So uh, you guys ready to go? Yeah, and then we're going to have a, a good amount of question time because everybody has their specific question they need help with, and I'll try and help with those. So let's start with cutting pipe here. There's a bunch of different ways everybody cuts pipe. I mean, if you got a hacksaw and you cut a pipe with a hacksaw, hey, it's going to work, okay? My preferred method is the little Milwaukee electric tube cutter. I love this thing. It works fantastic. The only gripe I have with this thing, if you look um, on that pipe right there, that's a piece of two-inch, you know, Schedule 80 pipe. It raises a lip on there when you cut it that lip is actually very detrimental to when you glue your pipe together. What that does is it screeds off the glue when you put it into the fitting. The fitting, the bell end of the fitting is actually slightly tapered and your pipe is straight. So when you put it in there, well, you just squeezed out half your glue right there. So what I like to do is deburr that. You can use a manual deburr, which is a tool that just goes on there and just scrapes it off. That works pretty good. Or they make handheld little just... I use a router, believe it or not, on anything over two inch. It's just a little handheld router with a 45-degree uh, a bit in it. I just knocked the corner off. I think I have a picture of that somewhere. There you go. That's a piece of 3-inch pipe, and we just bevel the corner. That's just standard way of doing it on PVC if you don't want a joint that's going to leak on you. Um, a lot of times we see tanks where you got a joint that's starting to seep over time and stuff like that. That's usually due to the fact that somebody didn't bevel that pipe, and when you stuck it in there, there's just not enough glue contact surface. So we'll go back here a little bit. Now, glue, for instance, there's all these different misconceptions on glue. Should I use primer? Should I not use primer? Should I use cleaner? Things like that. Um, over the years, I started out using the hardware store glue. And I found out real quick that it's not the best stuff out there. It actually produces a brittle joint, which you can actually crack apart and just pull the pipes apart. Um, a couple years ago, when my tank drained, that was a big accident, one of our six inch pipes burst, some of the fittings would just come apart. And that was done with the hardware store glue and primer. So we moved up to the weld on stuff. It's an industrial product. And frankly, I love this stuff. Once you glue something with this, it will just never come apart. I don't care what you do to it. I've actually beat it with a hammer and it still sits there. It's amazing. Primer use it. That's all I'm going to say about primer. Don't try and glue pipes without primer. Everybody tries to do it. The primer is what prepares the pipe for the bond. 
okay? If you just put PVC glue on it, it's just like putting epoxy on there and sticking it together. It really doesn't bond into the pipe at all. You can actually glue your pipes together with straight primer. Uh, we do it on a lot of the stuff we build, believe it or not. You just soften up the pipe, stick it together, and it's done. It will never come apart. The glue is there to fill the void. So if your pipe is out of round, which a lot of it is, or your sockets are not the proper dimensions, the glue is there just to fill the void in the pipe. So just think of it as like filler. But primer is a must, 100%. Use your primer if you don't want leaks. Um, I like the 7-Eleven primer. It's just a clear, good stuff. Um, I'll recommend that if you're in your giant fish tank like I have and you're sitting there on the floor gluing pipes together, you don't do it very often because you will pass out. And I learned that the hard way, fell right over. It's, it's good stuff, I'll tell you that. I mean, if you're into huffing, that is the stuff. I'm telling you right there. That is pure grade A huffing power right there. You know? And don't smoke around it either. My friend found that out the wrong way, lit the whole can up. It was fantastic, threw it across the room, had a great fire going. That was wonderful. So, like I said about glue and primer, use your primer. I'm not a big fan of cleaner. Cleaner just cleans off the dirt on your pipe. Don't use dirty pipe or wash your pipe first. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit weird, but I like to wash the outside of my pipe and the inside of my pipe. I mean, there's no reason to introduce a bunch of dirt into your tank. So do it the right way, clean your pipe, prime your pipe, and glue your pipe with a quality glue. This Ote stuff that you get from the hardware store is not the best glue. And a lot of us got thousands of dollars into these tanks. Some of us have you know, 50,000, hundreds of thousands of dollars in there. And you can take my advice, I learned it the hard way, and I had a huge disaster with this stuff. So we'll move on from glue here. I get a lot of questions all the time, the difference between Schedule 80 and Schedule 40. My favorite answer to that is, well, Schedule 40 is gray and Schedule 80, or Schedule 40 is white and Schedule 80 is gray. Mm, nope, that's not the right answer. Um, well, this is kind of hard because I don't know my left from my right. Believe it or not, I don't. So on the far side, you'll see a piece of Schedule 40 pipe. It's gray. This side, Schedule 80. The difference is the wall thickness, okay? I use a lot of Schedule 80 pipe because I machine a lot of stuff into it, and it has a thicker wall, so it gives me a little bit more meat to machine things into it. Schedule 40 gray pipe is great. We use that for a lot of plumbing lines because it flows a little bit more water, and we like it. It's just not as rigid. But I always use Schedule 80 fittings. Um, oh, I don't think I brought any. You see, I brought some Schedule 40 pipe. You know, it's just gray. You can get it a million different colors, but gray is my favorite. You know, I would say recommended for your guys' tanks and stuff like that. I mean, Schedule 40 that you get at the hardware store is more than adequate for the pressures you guys are running. Okay, I just like to use the Schedule 80 fittings because the fitting wall is much thicker, and it allows me to just bolt things together tighter and it gives me a lot more beef. And that's a big thing when you've got pipes running overhead that are three inches, and I've got some six inch diameter pipe up there. You don't want anything moving. And using the thicker wall pipe seems to help a lot because it doesn't sag, okay? Uh, let me get over here. That's our cut, bevel, okay. Bulkheads, so. We all have bulkheads in our tanks, right? Raise your hands, who has got a bulkhead? Okay, so everybody's got the bulkheads, that's good. Okay, now raise your hands of who, many use, who uses these bulkheads from like regular old aquarium supplier? Everybody uses these? Yep, we all grew up on these things. They work. They're made out of ABS plastic, okay? As you know, when you go to glue this stuff, it mushes out all over the place. I do not know for a million years why they make these things out of brittle ABS plastic, okay? It's, it's beyond me, I can't figure this out. How many of you guys have a tank that's bottom plumbed? Got bulkheads in the bottom of your tank. So this little piece of ABS plastic is what is between you and disaster, am I right? So, I don't like to bet my tank 
on ABS plastic. I'll tell you that right now. If you look at these things, I mean, anybody want to see one? Man, we all know what they are, okay. We use PVC bulkheads. They're made by Hayward or Spears. They're gonna cost you a little bit more, but remember, eBay is your friend, and you can find them on eBay for a lot cheaper than you can get these guys for. And that is a Schedule 80 bulkhead. Whoops, you can see it right there. That's a group of them. These things are monsters and you can put them through the bottom of your tank and never have to worry about anything leaking ever. You can actually get a wrench on there and tighten this thing up. You tighten this thing with a wrench, what does it do? It cracks, so not good, okay? You got a much, much thicker gasket on these. Get that out of there for you. Gasket is, yeah, that's about 3 16ths of an inch thick EPDM gasket, which is gonna absorb a lot of irregularities. Like if you're putting this through, like say a tank wall, like a plastic poly tank or one of those Rubbermaid tubs or something like this, this is great because you can just tighten this down with a pair of channel locks and you're never gonna have to worry about something leaking. They come in all different end varieties, socket, thread, thread, socket, whatever you want. Um, if I'm feeling cheap that day, I'll buy the ones with the threads in there and I'll just glue an adapter, like uh, just screw an adapter in there. We'll get to that in a minute, the best way to screw adapters into things. And it's not Teflon tape, I'll tell you that. Okay, so back a little bit more on the bulkheads here before I forget. So if you guys have these things ran through the bottom of your tank, especially for like your closed loops and stuff like that, by all means, please, buy a better bulkhead. If you guys need to know where to get them or anything else about them, just message me or find me. I'll tell you where to find these things. Don't go building a tank that's bottom plumbed or back plumbed with these things. You're just inviting a disaster for yourself, okay? Does anybody want to see one of these? Anybody? Yeah, you pass it around, you can see the difference between the two. I mean, they're a little bit larger in scale but that does allow you to actually, you know, really torque them down nice, which is a really fantastic thing, okay? Now, as I was saying, you know, a lot of us use these male adapters like this, and you screw them in the pipes, okay? Well, they're tapered, okay? NPT thread is national pipe taper, so it's actually kind of tapered. So as you screw it into the female part of it, it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Now, if you put Teflon tape on there, Okay, Teflon tape makes the threads a little bit wider. You're kind of wedging it in there. A lot of times you'll crack fittings. It happens on pump volutes all the time. It also happens on the Schedule 40 male adapters and the female adapters. You'll just crack that fitting right off. It might not happen right away because if it's a stress crack, it might take a couple of weeks to do it. What we've done to use the seal threaded fittings, and I've done this for over 20 years now, and never once have I had a trouble. Silicone, just a little bit of silicone ran on there. I use the stuff that comes in, looks like a cheese whiz can. It's an aerosol silicone. I think it's made by uh, uh, Henkel or somebody like that. Just put a little bead of that, screw it in there. You don't even have to give it long to cure. I mean, five, 10 minutes, this stuff is set up enough to where you can start running water through it. If you do that, you don't have to worry about a crack forming and you don't have to worry about a leak, okay? Because we all get that seep on a pump volume, right? You screw the fitting in there, and a week later you start seeing that little drip, another little drip, or somewhere else, and it just drives you up a wall. And the option is, well, what do I do? Do I take it all apart and redo it? Or do I put some duct tape on it, which I've seen? I've seen it wrapped in electrical tape. Um, I actually seen one guy just take a, it looked like a whole tube of silicone and just caked it like this with silicone for some bizarre reason, and then wrapped it with duct tape. I was like, oh, what the hell was that, you know? Um, my favorite by far was the Flexi Seal. I mean, that stuff they sell on TV. One of my friends had it all over the plumbing of his tank. And I was like, what in the hell are you doing? Why do you, well, it was dripping, so I Flexi Sealed it. I'm like, oh my God, okay. But back to what I was saying. A little bit of silicone goes a long way on threaded fittings, okay? A lot of people will say, oh, you're crazy for doing this, but it's done very commonly. I don't like the PTFE pipe paste stuff like that, it is just a mess. I mean, let's be honest, it never dries, gets on your hands, gets on your clothes, you try to take the pump apart, it's just a mess. Silicone, 
you unscrew the fitting when you're done, you brush it off. I just take a little like nylon bristle brush or an air hose and just blow the silicone off, it crumbles off, and you can just reuse the fitting again. It's, it's really nice. So. Yeah, like um, you can get it at the hardware store too. Yeah, like 3M, yep. You know, um, try and get the stuff that's not mildew resistant. Who knows what they have in there? You know, um, what they'll call it is like a silicone sealant. What works really good is the stuff that's in looks like a tube, a little plastic squeeze tube. You can cut the top off of it. Um, DAP makes it, 3M makes it. I mean, there's a million different brands. Like I said, I like the stuff that comes in an aerosol can. Um, looks like cheese whiz. But you just put a little bead on there. Um, if you want to go the extra mile, take a little bit on your finger and put it on the inside thread of the female part and just screw that thing together and forget about ever having a leak because it's not going to leak anymore on you. Okay, so we'll go on to our next thing. We're going to talk a bit about valves here. Everybody has questions about valves. Now, when I was digging around the place, I was trying to find a... Oh, everything's out of order. I was trying to find a regular valve like we all used to use. You know, the ones you get at the hardware store with the red handle, extremely hard to turn. You sit there and you know, you're wrenching on this thing and then the handle snaps off, right? And there's no way to get the valve out of there. You're just completely screwed. So I've moved into over the years is true union ball valves. This is a two inch Spears ball valve. I'm not gonna lie to you. These things are crazy expensive, okay? But when you have a larger tank and you need to remove a pump in the middle of the night, you're going to wish you put these things in there, okay? They're easy to turn. They're smooth because they have Teflon wipers inside of there, actual ball. But the beauty of a true union ball valve is it has unions on either end. You just take it apart. No drainage, no problems, no nothing, okay? So I would recommend highly anybody out there replace your valves, or if you're doing a new installation, just get these. Even if you're using the inexpensive ones, believe it or not, the ones at Lowe's that they sell that are True Union, they're made by a company called Legend, they're actually a really good valve. And for a two inch one, you can pick it up for 14 bucks. Uh, these Haywards here, they cost me about $90 a piece. But you get what you pay for in the valves. The nice things that we like about these is if we standardize on a valve, we can just buy extra end fittings. People don't know that. Hayward and a lot of the companies, if you want to reuse your valve like I do a lot of times, the end fittings are like 75 cents. So we just buy a bag of end fittings and well, it's fantastic. You just cut your pipe, glue new end fitting on there and recycle your valve. You can use the same valve for years. Thank you. Um, anybody want to see this thing? Uh, nice valve here, look at this. Ooh. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, you don't take it home, it's gotta come back with me. Well, I'll bring it back to you. Yeah, I like my valves. Okay, now, there's different kinds of valves, of course. Okay, that is a ball valve. The other thing we see is people, gate valves, okay? Ball valves and gate valves are used for two completely different things. Okay, stop trying to use the gate valve to shut off your flow to things. They're not used for that. Gate valves are used to throttle flow, to adjust it. I'll give you a hint. If you're gonna go skimmer shopping, okay, and you're like, oh, look at that skimmer, it looks really nice, and it's got a ball valve on the output of the thing, run away from it, okay? It's not gonna be any friendly to you. You want a gate valve to adjust flow, okay? Levels of skimmers and things like that, gate valve is what you want. Okay, don't use a gate valve on a pump, okay? Don't throttle your pump down with a gate valve. Pumps want to be run wide open. They don't want to have any back pressure, least amount of possible. So gate valve is your friend for throttling your flow, okay? Skimmers, um, going into media reactors, things like that, bypass loops, use a gate valve. Pumps, shutoffs, everything else, use a ball valve, okay? Now, all of us, well, pretty much everybody has a sump under their tank, right? So water shuts off or the power shuts off, water starts siphoning down into your tank. So everybody wants to use a check valve, okay? Now you can use a check valve, 
The best way to do it is to design your plumbing system to where you don't have to use a check valve, okay? Back in the day, we used to run a little pipe up, like loop-de-loop -loop over the top of the tank, or drill a hole in that, and we put a little piece of uh, RO tubing out to suck air in. Power goes out, it sucks air, and it breaks the siphon. It worked great. Problem is, it looked like crap, and it made a mess. So we're back to check valves again on pumps, okay? I don't like them, but it's a necessary evil. We have to use them, okay? There's certain ones you want to use, and there's certain ones you want to stay the hell away from, okay? This is a flapper-style check valve, okay? It's got a little rubber flap in there. The higher your head pressure, the harder this thing seals. So if you got 10 feet of head, it's pushing on that little valve in there really hard. It's not going to leak. These have worked well for me for 20 years now. I've used these. Never had anything fail. The only thing is you're going to have to take them out eventually and clean them. So this is a true union, just like the ball valve. You can take it out, dip it in vinegar if you want. If you want faster results, get some muriatic acid, the hardware store. It's just 37% hydrochloric acid. It'll eat right through that core line in about 30 seconds. Rinse it off, put it back into service again. You know, if you got a real bad Corlin problem, like I do, um, you might have to do it every six months to get it off of there, just to make sure it seals tight. You have something to drink here. I'm getting a little parched. You guys should have brought something to drink. See, I like tea. I'm a big fan of tea for some reason. I drink tons of it. It's a beer. beer? I'm not a big beer fan, even though I'm from Wisconsin. I just, you know, if I drink, bad things happen, you know? Really, really bad things. Um, Break out handcuffs. What did I say? Break out handcuffs. No. I, I put a bikini on one time, <laughs> then ran around in it. Oh, that was bad. OK, so back to check valves. Ball check valves, they have a ball in there. The ball seals against the seat. It's a fantastic idea. The problem with ball check valves, the fact is, they don't really seal too well. Okay, going in a reverse direction, but in the positive flow direction is they're extremely restrictive because the water has to go up and around this ball and then go again into a laminar stream. Water doesn't like to do that. Water likes to go straight. So you're really shooting yourself in the foot with a ball check valve. Just don't trust them. Okay. The one kind of check valve to absolutely 100% just never even put in your system, and I have no idea why they're selling these out there everywhere, are the plunger check valves. George Fisher started making them, then there's a couple of aquarium companies that started selling knockoff cheap versions of them. They look like a Y. <clears throat> I didn't have one to take a picture of, so I couldn't show you. And it has a weighted, usually made out of PVC or something, with a gasket on the side of it. And as the water flow stops, this weighted section slams down, really violently too, and seals it off, okay? The problem with this is we've all got sand in our tanks, coral and algae, debris. So for the first week, this, this check valve works fantastic. About about week two, there's so much crud stuck in there that it doesn't slide anymore. So your sliding check valve now does not work. It's just a straight piece of pipe with a Y in it. So stay away from those things. I see them at um, Bulk Reef sells them, I think, and some of these other suppliers are selling these things. Do not use these things, whatever you guys do. I mean, you're better off going to the hardware store and getting a sump pump check valve and using that versus one of those, because that thing is going to fail on you, guaranteed, 100%. Do any of you guys have those? You got some of those? Do me a favor. Can you replace them? Please? <laughs> they're, they are a disaster waiting to happen. And um, I'll tell you how I know. I had one on my 1,500-gallon tank years ago. I'm like, man, this is a great check valve. Bought it from George Fisher, spent like $150 on it. It's a big two-inch thing. I'm like, oh, look at this thing. It's fantastic. Hooked it all up, running great. A couple weeks later, power goes out. I go back in my fish room, and oh, look, half my fish tank is on the floor. I wonder how that happened, because I bought this really expensive check valve. So I took it apart, and lo and behold, the plunger is just solid in there. You know, just a couple of grains of sand, because the... The fit is so tight, all it took was like a couple of grains of sand, jam that thing solid, and it wasn't moving. And that was the end of it. And uh, could have saved myself a huge mess and a lot of money. So if you got them, just please replace them. You know, these are made by Spears. I like these. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of Spears stuff and George Fisher stuff. 
They got the double unions on them, they're great. Even if you just use the ones that don't have the unions on them, you can pick them up fairly inexpensively. Most all the aquarium places are selling them. Just use them, they're good, okay? But clean them occasionally. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about how you attach your piping to things. If I can find a picture of that, oh, okay. Who knows what that is? Anybody? Yeah, it's a pipe clamp, it's called a click clamp. And I had one, don't know where it went. You know, I bring this stuff and then I lose it, so. But I do have the other version, but I got a picture of it. Okay, clip clamps are great, okay? I'm not a fan of using uh, conduit straps or those little J-hook hangers. You know, you see them at the hardware store and everybody hangs their drain waste vent pipes with these things. I just don't care for them. I like a much more solid connection. These things here, you use one screw in the back, screw it on, click it up there. If you want to take it off, you stick a screwdriver in it, pop it off. They work fantastic. Nice, tight hold. You can get everything nice and straight. You never have any problems with it. Really good clamp, we use them on everything, okay? Like I said, the conduit clamps, they're nice, but what's everybody do? We screw them in with drywall screws, right? And then they rust. So that looks like crap in about a week. If you want to go to the real extra mile, Acne Strut. We use tons of this stuff. It's a fiberglass clamping system. We use a strut like Unistrut. Clamps slide in there. They come in every different size. Plus, you can get all sorts of brackets, L's, anything you want to do with this stuff. And it's all corrosion resistant. The bolts are fiberglass. Everything's fiberglass. This will not come apart. This is great stuff. If anybody wants to know where to get it, let me know. I'll tell you. But it's really nice if you've got a larger tank and you want to run a bunch of pipes underneath. You just cut your struts, put them underneath there, and you can slide these diff foot up and down any way you want. They're very, very movable, and they're very easy to use. Anybody want to see these? Yeah. These are my favorite, by the way. Um, most industrial plumbing supply places will sell that stuff. You know, it's made by a company called Acne Strut. I think Unistrut also has a version of it. It's just an FRP, which is, you know, fiberglass reinforced plastic. I haven't broken one yet, believe it or not. And we run them all the way up to eight inches on, you know, heat exchangers and stuff, and they just work fantastic. I'm a big proponent of making piping look nice. I mean, the back of your fish tank should reflect the inside of your tank, if you ask me. Even though the inside of my tank looks like a disaster right now, my pipes look really nice, though. <laughs> Oh, there's my valve. There's my gate valve. I was looking for those. Oh, actuated valves. Any of you guys into actuated valves at all? Anybody use them? Okay. Actuated valve is just a motor, sits on there, opens and closes the valve. Extremely easy to wire up. You can use an SPDT relay to do it. So you apply power, it opens, remove power, it closes. Um, I'm not going to go too much into it, but if you guys want some more information on those things, just find me and I'll talk you through it, how to wire one up or something. But they're great for automating systems. You can plug them into your Neptune and use your Neptune to you know, control different things if you want. Now we're going to get into my biggest pet peeve in the whole world of plumbing, okay? So we all have a pump, right? Everybody does this. We use a female adapter or a male adapter into the pump. And for some reason, we put a length of pipe and then a union and then a ball valve. I have no idea why I see this all the time, okay? What you want, the whole reason of putting a valve there is to be able to get that pump out of there easily when the pump leaks, fails, or needs cleaning, right? Without flooding your living room, your basement, or anything like that. So if you go to picture two here, You can get the valve real nice and tight on your pump. A million different reasons you would want to do that, okay? One is aesthetics. It looks a hell of a lot nicer than a big pipe sticking off of it. But the more important thing is when you need to shut off that pump, you just turn the valve, unscrew this, and about two ounces of water drips out of that pipe. Maybe a little bit more depending on the pump. Pull it out, and if you have a spare pump, like a lot of us do, you know, to back up the pump, because there's a certain round of pump that likes to leak a lot. I'm not gonna mention that. Oh, sorry about that. So you have your spare pump, you just toss your spare pump in there and you're back and running, because you know, your pump's gonna leak in, uh, you know, probably Christmas Eve, 
about 11 o'clock at night. That's usually when they do it, and you have no chance of getting a spare anywhere. So if you've got one, you're good to go. And it takes you less than five minutes to change out a whole pump that way. It's a fantastic way of doing it. But how we do it is we use, looks like a little male adapter. All it is is a piece of threaded pipe. If you've got smaller pumps, you can go to a hardware store, buy a piece of straight threaded pipe, cut it off, glue it right into the pump like, or the valve like that, and just thread that into your pump. That's it. This sits right against the housing. It's nice, it's clean, it's simple, and it works really, really well. Then you don't have to worry about anything like, you know, taking your pump off of there. <clears throat> Let's see what we got next here. That's just how it comes apart, pretty simple. I'm gonna talk a little bit about flow here and fittings. So a lot of us use what's called a drain waste and vent fitting, right? Comes from the hardware store, looks like a sweep. Okay, I didn't have any pictures of those, so I was running at the last minute doing this, but they're the standard white ones everybody uses for drain pipes and stuff. The problem with a drain waste and vent fitting, especially in a pressure application, is the hub that the pipe glues into, like this part right here, is very short. So it doesn't give you a lot of contact for your pipe. So if you're using it on a larger system that has any sort of a larger pump on it, I would not recommend it, because that will actually pop out of there on you and it's not a good thing to do. So if you're running bigger systems, try and stay away from the drain waste and vent fittings. Get the pressure rated fittings. They're the ones that look like that, or in the bottom picture look like that elbow right there. Now, a lot of people say that, oh, well I use the drain waste and vent fittings, the sweeps and stuff, which is a long sweep because it allows me to flow more water. Well, if you ever put a flow meter on that pipe, you'll find out that it really doesn't. You know, I sat down for about a week with a flow meter and just started measuring pipe fittings one day. I wanted to see in the real world what impacted my flow the most, okay? Now, you see a lot of guys out there will run 245s like that, right? Any of you guys do that? Run 245s to make a 90? Yep. Doesn't really help that much, okay? If you put a flow meter on there like a George Fisher or something like that, you'll see no noticeable difference in flow. It's nice to go around corners and things like that, but it's also a pain in the butt to line up. You just use a regular old 90 and it flows just fine for you, okay? It's actually gonna flow the same amount of water based on the meter. Now the book will tell you otherwise, you know, you can look up flow charts and things like that for pipe fittings and they'll tell you, oh, 245s are less restriction. But in the real world, it does not appear to be that way. You know, based on a digital flow meter, we're not seeing any noticeable gains or any noticeable reduction by going with a straight 90 fitting on there at all. <clears throat> I do like the 45s though. I mean, I use a lot of them, I'm not gonna lie, but a 45 cost me $5 where a 90 cost me 90 cents. So there's a big price difference there. But like if you wanna stagger pipes, you wanna come up like that, go like that, then 45s are your guy. Don't, try not to what we call a dog leg, which is a sharp 90 up and then a 90 over again. You use 245s to dog leg it over. That's a much nicer way to do it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get my train of thought here for a second. My mouth's been running and my brain hasn't caught up yet. Yeah, it's one of those mornings. <clears throat> I'm talk a little bit about intake screens. I had one of those with me. These ones here that I'm using, these are sold at pretty much every hardware store. And what they are is they're used as well screens. Okay. On your intake screen for your pump, you can never have a big enough one, I'm telling you. If you use the little ones, like little two inch guys, or look like a cone, they work pretty good if you keep them clean. So I found these things here. Um, that's actually just the half section of it. They come in two sections, they're screwed together. So you take the screws apart and voila, you got two of them for, you know, I think they're like 10 bucks each, but they're big. And you can flow a lot of water through those things and they work fantastic. So if you're looking for one, they're well screens. And they're just a, a nice screen to use for your pumps. It's about the best one I ever found because it's large enough to flow a lot of water. Even if it starts to get clogged up, it doesn't give you a problem. But the really nice thing is it has so much surface area on it that it doesn't create enough suction to suck a fish against it. So I've got some in my tank for my closed loops and there's not enough suction on that thing to suck a fish against it so the fish don't care about it. They just use it as a back scratcher. So you see them in the back corner doing this. Yeah. My, my fish are weird, they have issues, you know, lots of issues. You know, how many of your fish scratch themselves against an urchin? 
Anybody got that? I'm just gonna throw this out here because I've been wondering this for a long time. We have a couple of fish in our tank that go right up against the urchins. I mean, we have some big urchins in there and they just start scratching. We have one blue hepatus that jams its face into the urchin and just goes back at, it's, what are you doing? So I was always wondering, you know, since I got an audience of people, do anybody's fish do this? So it's just mine, huh? That's fantastic, great. I got crazy fish. Yeah, don't ever get a big tank. You see weird things happening. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to get towards an uh, interesting subject here of overflows. How many of you guys got an overflow on your tank? Raise your hand. How many of your overflows make obnoxious noises? Gurgling, farting, all these other noises. Okay. How many of you guys got these contraptions? This bean overflow or something, this pipe that goes up, goes over, goes around, wraps around the house a few times, comes up, has a line coming out of it. How many of you guys got those? Okay, do they work well? Yeah, they work good? Okay, I've never really tried one. What is that? Bring it high enough. Bring it high enough? Okay. I have a much simpler version, and I've been doing this, like I said, 20 years. I've had tanks on the second floor of my house, ran all the way down to the basement, Never had a sound, never wanted one. So <clears throat> I always do it the same way. And the key to that is a gate valve. Once again, the miraculous gate valve. So you look at the picture there, that's your overflow. I always like redundancy. I'm a big, huge fan of redundancy. If one pipe is good, guess what? Two pipes are better. When the first one clogs, you got a spare. And if you're going to do this and you only want to do it one time, this is the way to do it. So. If you look at the first one, say from, uh, let me see here, this would be my, what is that, the left? Yeah, okay, the left side. That is your high overflow. So say something got in your overflow and plugged up the other two and you had strainers on them, you still have one more reserve pipe for the water to go down. You definitely want to do that. It sounds like complete overkill and you're like, Bill, you're crazy, you're wasting all these pipes. No, guaranteed something will eventually get in your overflow and will clog the first two up, either a fish, a snail, or something. So always have a high overflow pipe. Just a spare does nothing but just sits there, okay, until that one day when it's needed, okay? The middle one is your trickle overflow, okay? When you throttle back when you get your tank set up, okay, and you got the water going into your sump and you hear this horrible sound, looks, sounds like a toilet going through there, okay, you wanna start cranking on this gate valve, okay? And you wanna bring the water level up to that middle overflow pipe, okay? Just to where it's just trickling over that, okay? Now what I like to do is I like to get it really close almost to the top of the teeth there to really eliminate the noise. You know, you don't really need a lot of overflow at all. You just need it to get into that pipe. So you just throttle it back. The closer you put this valve here to your sump, the better this is gonna work. If you put it right underneath your overflow, it's gonna work, but you gotta get that pipe filled with water first. If you have this all the way down at your sump and you can crank it down there and adjust it, this is gonna work beautifully. It'll never make a sound. It's inexpensive, price of a gate valve, and it will never fail you. That's the beautiful thing with it. You know, you don't have to start siphons, you don't have to do anything else. And on top of it, you've got your redundant pipe right there. So when you're out of town and you're like, oh man, I hope my fish really doesn't go over my overflow and decide to go clog my pipe. Well, you'd have to have three fish jump in there to clog your pipe. So that's pretty unrealistic that that's gonna happen. So the gate valve for the overflow works fantastic, okay? And again, use good quality bulkheads. Don't use the cheap ones on that, okay? Has anybody got any questions about the overflows at all?